Daniel chapter 3. And verse number 1. Daniel 3, 1. The scripture says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, the breadth thereof six cubits, he set it up in the plains of Dur and the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent together together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Father, bless this word in thy holy name. Amen. Now, the book of Daniel is a book that is what we call a uh, book of prophecy that is written during what's called the captivity. Israel spent 70 years in captivity. And we're in Babylon. The two southern tribes, Benjamin and Judah, wound up in Babylonian captivity. The ten northern tribes wound up in Assyrian captivity. It was different in nature. But all of Israel at one time was carried off into captivity. And God told them it was going to happen, and it did. But during this period of time, he showed his sovereignty and he showed his graciousness. Even though his people were in captivity, he wanted them to understand he was still God and he was still the Lord and nothing had changed. And that's a lesson we can learn for today in 2024 because all around you, it looks like everything has changed. Remember how I started this tonight? And so is there anything that we can hold on to that does not change? And I'm glad there is. So when we look at the book of Daniel, we have an image. And this image is raised up in the plains of Dur about 606 B.C. Now you may find variants, uh, variant dates on that, 605, 607, so forth and so on. Don't let that bother you, dates like that, because a lot of dates are arbitrary and they have their own opinion and so forth. But about 606 B.C. something started that's called the Times of the Gentiles. Our Lord talks about it in the book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 24. And here's what he says. Luke 21 and verse number 24 in reference to this. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You're watching that now. You're watching the trampling down of Jerusalem. You're watching it. You're living in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. But our Lord Jesus Christ called it the times of the Gentiles. One of the great truths in understanding the Bible is the fact that the Scripture has to do with all time, but time is segmented in different ways, in dispensations or periods where God deals with people in a certain way. The times of the Gentiles started in 606 B.C., and will end in a calamitous matter when the stone cut out of a mountain without hands smites the image on its feet and it comes tumbling down. The uh, book of Daniel, which is, uh, it's, it, it, you talk about a, bio, a book maligned, and the book of Daniel, by most, most liberals say the book of Daniel was written after the fact of these successive kingdoms that arose and then made it look like that it was prophecy. Well, that's, that's typical liberalism. And scripture for that, uh, uh, you know, proof, of, proof for that, they have none. The Lord Jesus Christ called Daniel a prophet. Remember, he called him a prophet. And I'm going to take the Lord any day over these so-called uh, scholars. So we have, first of all, the head of, of gold, and that's Nebuchadnezzar. Then we have a, a chest of silver. These are the Medes and Persians. Then we have a midsection of brass. This is Grisha, Alexander the Great. And then we have finally legs of iron. And then they, they, they consummate an iron mixed with clay, a supernatural thing that does not come naturally. And it represents the successive Gentile kingdoms from the head of gold, and which is the greatest, Babylon was. Gold by far is more valuable than anything that followed it. And then silver is second in value to gold. And then we have brass and then iron. And it, there's a lot in that, but that's not what I'll be dealing with here, in here tonight. But I just want you to understand 
that we're still living in the times of the Gentiles. This is important. We're still living there. Now, the church of God exists right now on this earth, all right? And these successive kingdoms, and where we are now is in Rome, the Iron Kingdom is not part of the church of God. And the church of God is not part in any way with that image. You need to keep that in mind. In the book of Romans, chapter number 11 and verse number 25, here's what your scripture says. Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 25. We get right smack into the tribulation period and coming up to the end of the millennium. And notice what it says over here. Romans chapter 11 and verse number 25. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, the fullness of the Gentiles, most people believe, has to do with the filling up of the body of Christ and those Gentiles that are going to be saved. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the way they, uh, they, they uh, define this. I tend to agree that that's pretty well as close as we can get it right now. The Bible is not real clear on this, but I do not believe that the fullness of the Gentiles and the times of the Gentiles are the same, one and the same. They're not. The times of the Gentiles has to do when the Gentiles are in power, and they are right now. The fullness of the Gentiles has to do with him dealing with the Gentiles, as right now the church of God is made up of a lot mostly of Gentiles. And so it will be filled up. It will be filling up. And for the fulfillment of this prophecy in Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 25. You need to keep this in mind. The John chapter number 18 and verse number 36, if you want to turn there with me. You don't hear this mentioned very much. And uh, the reason you don't is because usually when you don't have something mentioned much is because it either doesn't fit with the, uh, uh, the theology of that particular denomination or for whatever reason. But in John chapter number 18 and verse number 36, now I want you to look at this. Jeez, uh, look at verse 35. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. That world could be understood in two ways, of this present world or of this age. could have to do with both of them. But notice carefully, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants do what? Notice the fight. There's no turning a cheek here. You understand this? This is important in understanding the Bible. He told his disciples, go buy a sword. Sell this and buy a sword. What's a sword? A sword is an instrument of war. That's what he told them to do. And somebody said, well, didn't he tell them to turn the cheek? Yes, he did. And this is why we get into what's called the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The United States with all the rest of the Gentile world is part of the times of the Gentiles. The United States. Now, you don't think about this for a moment. This is your country. This is your nation. All right? This is it. But the United States is not the church. That's important. That's important. Uh, you're a patriot. That's all fine. That's well and good. Uh, today we have a religion, as I've mentioned to you before, of God and family and country. That's all fine as far as it goes. But that's not the gospel. Okay? That's not the gospel. Don't ever get caught up in patriotism and thinking that patriotism is uh, kind of trumps the fact that we have a church, the body of Christ, which is being built by the Holy Spirit, not us. I don't build the church. He does. And the Gentile kingdoms are going to come to a quick end. And I don't know when. I don't know how soon that's going to be. But it's going to happen when he comes with his kingdom. Revelation 11, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. 
And if you, re if you remember reading Revelation chapter 19, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make peace. See, you all are listening. <laughs> he doth judge and make war. He's coming back as a man of war, not a man of peace. Now, it's not our place today to carry swords around and cut people's heads off and force them by a sword into conversion. And the church is not built that way. We don't tie people to stakes and burn them alive, although that's been done in the name of the Lord. Spanish Inquisition under Torquemada in Spain was one of the most horrendous things that ever happened on the face of this earth. And someone someday will give an account for the innocent lives that died that, uh, during that period of time. Uh, during, the, during the Inquisition. Auto de fe, they said. Auto de fe. Tie them to the pole. Pile the faggots around them. And burn them alive. I don't want any part of that religion, okay? If that's your religion, r mark me off. I'm not part of it. Amen. Amen. Want nothing to do with it. So when you carry a sword today, as far as you personally, you carry it for defense, for self-defense, all right? unless you're called upon to go serve in the military and serve honorably to serve your nation, you serve your country, then you carry it as a weapon of war. But you do not carry it to convert people to the name of Christ. That's not how his church is built. And that's important to understand that because that's a, that's a basic principle in Scripture. Now, the church of God, I want you to look at over here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. And verse number 32. You hear me use this term all the time. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. And the reason I use it is because it is the scriptural term for the church. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. You see that? All right, now that's just one of many places it's found. Did you know that the term the church of Christ is not in the Bible? Churches of Christ, speaking in a plural, you know, it doesn't mean that they are called church of Christ. Their churches of Christ is mentioned in the Bible. Presbyterian church is not in there. Baptist church is not in there. Methodist church is not in there. They're not to be found. Now this is not... You know, to say that the Baptist church in its sense is wrong, although there are many different types of Baptist. When you get to studying the thing, find out where we came from, essentially from what's called the Anabaptist. And the Amish and the Mennonites and other groups uh, essentially came from the same source. Rebaptizers is what that means, Anabaptists. Why did they do that? They believed in only baptizing believers. Baby infant baptism they rejected then and I reject it now. Baptism is for believers, you know, and, and on top of that, babies don't go to hell. Amen. Amen. Keep that in mind. But in any event, Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two. 22, whatever you not houses to eat, drink in, or despise you the church of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. 2 Corinthians 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. 2 Corinthians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Galatians 1, 3, you've heard of my conversation time past. In the Jews' religion, how beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And then in 1 Timothy 3, 5, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, there is a church, denominations called the church of God. And they refer to them as that. And I'm not up here tonight to tell them that they don't have any business using the term. But I have as much right to call this church the church of God as they do to call that one the church of God because it's a scriptural term. What I am tonight is a bishop in the church of God. 
I want you to think about what I just said to you. I'm a bishop in the church of God. I said, what does that mean, preacher? That means that I am a bishop to any believer that is a believer in our Lord Jesus Christ who wants to come unto the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what I am. You may not call yourself a Baptist. You may not call yourself a Presbyterian, a Lutheran, or whatever. But if you want to come to Christ, then the door is wide open. And the last thing I am is a Baptist brighter. I'm as far from a Baptist brighter as I am a Buddhist. Amen, folks. That, that, that's, and I'm, you know, I don't want to get off into a lot of things tonight. I know there's some people out there that are good people. I don't doubt that. But the idea that the Baptist church is the only bride of Christ on this earth, they didn't get that from the Scripture. They didn't get that from the Word of God. So the reason we make, it, we make, we make an effort to identify it is because we know that the church is not brick and mortar. We know it's not a building. We know it's not uh, a physical thing. We know the church is made up of born-again believers. That's his body, all right? And we call it, in Scripture, the church of God. Now, what if America, what if it gets nuked tomorrow? What if they turn loose of these nukes out here? Did you know there's enough nuclear weapons out here to essentially wipe most of humanity off the face of this earth? What a, what a thing. When Oppenheimer said, what have we done? <laughs> no doubt, what have you done? And, uh, and of course, uh, President Truman gave the word to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What have they done? They opened the nuclear age. Yes, they did. What's all that mean? That means America could cease to exist in a week. As you know it, it could cease to exist. But would a nuke destroy the church of God? Oh, no. No, make no mistake about it. No. The church will be here whether America makes it or not. Now, here's the thing. You get into politics. All right? You get into politics. Some of you, most of you probably are Republicans. I don't know. Some independents. Some Democrats. We may even have some Whigs in here. With, who knows? But <laughs> bottom line is, a lot of people associate politics with the church. Folks, politics has nothing to do with the church of God. Our mission is to preach the gospel of Christ. All right? It's to preach the gospel of Christ. Uh, for example, social problems, plenty of them. Do something about feeding people, feeding the hungry, taking care of the sick. I'm all for it. Do what you can. Uh, dealing with the issue of, of, of sodomy, transgenderism, what they're trying to do to our young people, I'm all for taking a position, a rightful position about all of that. Absolutely, without question. I will go with a man as far as I possibly can. No doubt about it. But let me tell you something. Even though I do that, that is not the gospel. That's important. That's not the gospel. If you stand on the street corner and hold up a sign and say, you know, uh, life begins uh, 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 at conception, whatever you want to say, you know, uh, uh, against abortion, I'm all for it. But that's not the gospel. And we've got a lot that needs to be understood today because there's a lot of people out there that are acting like it is, and it's not. So what is the gospel? Well, look at 1 Corinthians 15 and let the Bible define it for you. Now, I told you about the fellow who's on there. He's for... He's a believer in God, and he's a believer in family, and he's a believer in country. And then he's got a fifth of liquor. I don't remember what brand it is, but this is a new religion. You think I'm kidding you tonight. I'm not. There's a lot of people in this country that relate patriotism to Christ, and it's not the same. It's not the same. It's important to understand that. The, apo the apostle said in 1 Corinthians 15, More for brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you've received, and wherein you stand, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you first of all that which I received, how Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that it was buried. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Then what follows is proof. And then he was seen of these witnesses. Now, turn to Romans 10. Verse 
verse number 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now watch this. This is part of of what you just read, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, in other words, Jesus is Lord, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now let's break this down for a moment. Now some of you may remember, we've been through this before, but it's important tonight to understand what this apostle is saying. First of all, righteousness, righteousness in the Bible has to do with what you do how you live and how you are presented to God and how you're accepted. That's righteousness. Three men in the Old Testament are mentioned as being more righteous than all the rest of them that lived. Job, Noah, and Daniel. Their names are mentioned. All right. But when the Lord Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago, he lived a life that no one had ever lived before. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And by doing that, he established a righteousness that did not exist he showed up. Now, apply that to this text. Now look at it carefully. Uh, Romans 10, verse number 6. The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Do not say in your heart, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Here we go. This is someone saying, wait a minute, there's nobody, <laughs> well, there's nobody good enough to ascend. Now we're not talking about going to heaven. Elijah went to heaven. Enoch was not for God took him. We're talking about ascending into heaven, which is an entirely different thing. Rising from the earth, which can no longer hold you, and rising into the presence of God. All right? Who can do that? Well, the question is posed. Nobody can do that. That's what they're saying. They're saying if you take the position that nobody has ever lived this earth that's good enough to ascend into the presence of God, then that's who you're talking about right here. You see, here's why he says about it. Don't ever say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? He said, if you say that, that is to bring Christ down from above. See that? That's to say he didn't really ascend. In plain words, he was not perfect and sinless. That's the application. Now, let me ask you a question tonight. Do you believe the Lord Jesus Christ was perfect and sinless? Yes. Absolutely. I've never met a Christian who had any problem with that. No. No problem. I believe, he's, I believe he's perfect, sinless, in every sense of the word, and I do not believe that he could sin. Now, some Christians say that he could. I don't buy it. I believe he was sinless and, and, uh, and could not. But anyway, all right, I passed the first test. I passed that test right now. I believe he ascended into the presence of God on his own righteousness. That's what he's saying. That's the question. Okay. Now look at verse number seven. Or who shall descend into the deep? Now get that word deep. If you, if you look at a Greek text, that's the word abyssos. That's where we get our word abyss. Yeah. An unmeasurable, unknowable launch into the deep. And if you remember these demons in the Old Testament, I mean, not the Old Testament, back in the book of Luke, chapter 8, and uh, I think it's, let's see, Luke chapter 8 and verse number uh, 31. Yeah, here we go. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 30, it says, Jesus asked them, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him, now look at this, they feared this. They besought him, saying, they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. See, the abyss. This is not necessarily hell. No, this is a place. Similar, I guess you might say, to what's called the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter number 9 
where they come up out of that pit. But I'm not going to get into that. I don't confuse anybody. The abyss is the location that is like the Mariana Trench, you know, over five miles deep in the Atlantic Ocean, down in the area of the Caribbean. It's deep. A man cannot go that deep. And there are creatures down there that defy understanding. But in any event, it is the abyss. Do not cast us into the abyss. Now, you say, well, what, how does that work? Well, go back to Romans 10 with me. Romans 10. Romans chapter number 10. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. All right. In plainer words, his righteousness gave him the qualifications, authority to appear in the very presence of God. Now look at the text again. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. In other words, there's no way that he could have gone down to a place like that. He, I mean, this you're talking about something even lower than hell itself. Uh, they say, why, how in the world could someone do this? There's no way I could believe that he could do that. And so they're saying, oh no, he does not have authority to go up or authority to go down and come back up from where he went. We reject that. This is what these people are saying. Not me, these people. And he says, if you say that, you're not saved and you can't be saved and you never will be saved until you're willing to accept the fact that he descended into the lowest place, the abyss. He descended and he came back up out of it. And he did. He arose. On the third day, he arose. He arose. So that gives him power over death. Yes. Because I live, ye shall live. And that gives him righteousness that no one else has. And when I read that and get a hold of that, you know what that does for me when it's righteousness? When I get to thinking about that, I think to myself, good night, what am I, I mean, what are we strutting around for anyway? Even our best state, we're all together. We've, we've missed it. I hope there's nobody in here deluded to think that you don't sin. You do. This is what fellowship is about. Remember, I keep taking you back to 1 John 1. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. God's son cleanses from all sin. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth's not in you. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we call him a liar. And the truth is not in us. How many people have you heard say they don't sin? See? We say, preacher, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't. That'd make a difference. You're trusting your own ability to discern your heart? <laughs> See? You're, you better leave that up to the Holy Spirit. This is why David cried in the Old Testament, there any hidden sin, any hidden way, show me, Lord. Search me. Try me. And see if there be any hidden way in me. And I'll get along with God and we'll have fellowship and I'll talk to the good Lord. And I like to talk to him. Then he talks back to me. I know I'm ready for the funny farm. If you think he, a lot of people think if God's talking to you, he's, he's hearing spirits, you know, that kind of thing. He does, though. But then here and there, the Almighty will begin to move in my soul. And he'll begin to point something out inside me that was not readily apparent and he is ready to deal with it. He's ready to deal with it. And then when he comes to that point where he's ready to deal with it, he's dealing with it in a highest level it can be dealt with before it ever becomes a reality and fact. In other words, before it's perpetrated, before, before the deed is ever done. See what I mean? He can stop it in your heart before it ever comes out because where do, where do your sins come from? They come out of the heart. That's where they come from. And he could stop it. And that, thank God for that. Amen. So, when we talk about this, we have to say to ourselves, yes, I believe. Do you believe he's sinless? And do you believe that his righteousness qualified him to enter into the presence of God? 
And that's what the apostle says in Romans chapter number 10. That's what you should be able to do. Now I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter number 2. And this will, we'll close with this tonight. But this will give you an idea of what it means to be a good citizen. In 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 13. Now the apostle says, having your conversation, that's your life, your manner of life, the way you live, honest among the Gentiles. Remember the Jew, the Gentile, and the what? These are three basic uh, divisions of the Bible, and you'll find that it runs all the way through it like that. The Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, and whereas they speak evil against you, Whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Christians have been called upon to live under practically every possible form of human government. Why? Because we're living in the times of the Gentiles. You see what I mean? The times of the Gentiles. Great Britain is very similar to us. They have a parliament. And they have a house of lords and a house of commons. They prime minister gets up and he answers questions, deals with running the government. They have a voice in the government. The people elect their officials. I don't know if you've been keeping up with it, but you ought to get on YouTube and look at what's happening in Great Britain right now. You ought to look. You ought to look. But their form of government is not exactly like ours. You see, one of the, I think that one of the weakest points of our government is that we only have two political parties. Now, I know we have independence, but, the, you know, there's no power. Do you know what I would like to see? I would like to see people put to the test, however you'd like to form it, however you'd like to do it, test them, get their knowledge, see how much they know about the government and about the world, and if they pass that test, put them in a group, and the government takes care of paying for their political uh, uh, contest. In other words, for, in other words, no big business, no money from the outside, no billionaires. It's all paid for, and the people who run are those that are qualified and know what to do, know what they're going to do, find out who these people really are, and the money is never an issue, and let them run. And then uh, whoever the people decide they want out of, that, out, of, out, of, out of a group like that, then, uh, then put, them, put them in office, and then when they go into office, let them form what's called a coalition government. What is that? A coalition government means that you may have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, twenty 10, 15, 20 uh, political parties. And in order for you to govern a nation, you must have support from at least a certain number of those political parties to form a government. This gives a voice to other people to give you a government where we don't have a thing, like a monster like we have in this country. A coalition government. I like the way coalition governments operate. Now, they have their weaknesses. I understand all that. But to form a governing body where many different people have a real voice in how that government is run and the people that are put in power and put in the office in that nation owe nothing to any bunch, any, any you know, the big financiers, the billionaires and so forth. They don't owe it. And they're qualified they have passed the test, they're qualified, and color has nothing to do with it whatsoever. No DEI uh, candidates, just qualified. And if you know the stuff, then you can be the one, you can be one of them that uh, and are qualified to run the nation. I think that would bring a lot of peace to this nation. Did you know how this nation right now is on the verge, of possibly the way some are talking of a civil war? Do you understand that this election coming up right now is, uh, is a tinderbox? 
Yes, it is. And, and, I, and I tried my dead level best tonight to show you how that the Republican Party does not represent the Church of God. The Democrat Party does not represent the Church of God. The Church of God is an entirely separate, complete entity from either one of those groups. But there are elements in the political parties that I would agree with, I support, things of that nature. You follow me tonight. I would support them. Yes, I would. And, uh, and, and this is the way that, that, it, that, we should, that we should face the, and deal with these issues. But I would hate to see another civil war in this nation because the nation cannot govern itself. And that's where we are right now. This nation cannot govern itself. And this constitution that was written uh, is one of the finest uh, man-made documents on earth. And yet for some reason it's not, uh, it's apparently hadn't been enough to keep America right. How many of you agree with what I'm saying tonight? Amen. It's not, it's, it's not working. It's not working. There's some mad people out there. Very mad, very angry. And so you keep that in mind. Well, preacher, what's the answer? Even so come, Lord Jesus, come. That's the answer. <laughs> Lord, come back. Amen, amen, amen. Father, thank you for the time in your house. Bless, bless these dear folk who've gathered. Bless the few things I've said. A lot, some of these things tonight are my opinion. Lord, I know that. I know that. They're my opinion. They're the way I see things and the way I feel about them. I don't give it out as scripture. I don't say it's the word of God. I, I do, for no way in the world would I say that to people, that they have to believe what I've said about things like that. But when I say the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that's the gospel. And that, my dear friend, tonight is God's word. In Jesus' name, amen.